Wellness by Designs, and I'm your host, Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining us today is Susan Hunter, a clinical naturopath, and today we'll be discussing navigating children's mental disorders. Welcome to Wellness by Design, Susan. How are you going? I'm really well, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. It's a bit of an hour honour, actually. Now, of course, tell us a little bit about your history because you come from a deeply science background, right? Yeah. So, look, I've I've um, originally studied to become a psychologist. That didn't work out so well when I got to the statistics part of the degree. Uh, but yeah, definitely did my undergrad in psychology and also studied and majored in health sociology. So I really had an interest in human psych and human well-being, and it was something that needed to kind of um, run its course and I needed some time away after that degree to work out what I really wanted to do and then resume study a few years later after traveling and uh, did my Bachelor of Health Science in naturopathy. Tell us a little bit about that journey because I mean it's really interesting to me you and I were discussing this a little while ago you come from this hardcore science investigational um uh study um and then you went over to southeast asia is that right or him or tibet yes yeah, so it was the other way around what had happened I, well i guess you know yes i'd oh. done that arts degree with the the psych and and the science but uh i i went off and traveled through southeast asia and landed there for a while and sort of explored more of the esoteric elements around well-being and really took an open mind. And I think when you're in your 20s, you tend to be more open to all sorts of things. So I spent a bit of time sort of exploring different kind of paradigms like, you know, Ayurvedic medicine, looking into, you know, things like the I Ching and Buddhism and, you know, it was all around balancing my chakras, loved the idea of kinesiology and, um, even became a vegetarian for a while. And I remember coming back to Melbourne and my grandfather just saying, no, you know, child of ours is going to be a vegetarian. We eat meat. And uh, also was wondering how can I bring all of this beautiful information and ways of living um, back and, and incorporate that into a career of sorts. And so I went off to, um, I think it was the Australian College of Natural Medicine at the time in Melbourne and did their history and philosophy of natural medicine subject, but also did an anatomy and physiology subject to kind of balance things out by doing a bit of the biomedical stuff, but also learning about the history of natural medicine. And I felt like, yeah, I loved both elements and, uh, and signed up and, and just did the degree pretty much full time for four years. That was, that was pretty open of you to to want to come back and and share, you know, what is such a rich ancient culture, um, and try and incorporate that into the science that you've learnt. Um, so, I mean, it's a pretty interesting meeting of the ways. I've got to say, you know, you say in in our twenties most of us are open. I wasn't. I was really judgmental oh. and. Quite quite rigid and searching for me and all that sort of thing so that i'm quite impressed by this openness that you have towards you know embracing other aspects other viewpoints yeah i think uh, i still try and do that now and i think it helps us just be better human beings by evolving and being open to everything that's new and it just means you add to the knowledge base that you have as you explore and read and experience more. So as a clinician now, I'd like to think that I um, do, you know, come bring a, a sense of, you know, being holistic in the way that I approach my clients. And often I will refer to, you know, various mind-body therapists um, to assist them, but also really it work very much in an evidence-based and, and, and reliance on the bio, and the nutritional biochemistry to help people get back to balance. Right, okay. So, look, let's get into the subject matter, um, kids. Now, 
just how big an issue are we talking about here, especially in this new COVID era that we now live in? Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, we knew before COVID that we had a big problem when it came Mm. to paediatric mental health. Um, The Australian Child and Adolescent Survey of Mental Health and Wellbeing, this is back in 2014, had found one in seven or 13.9% of children aged four to 17 had a mental disorder. And ADHD was the most common, um, followed by anxiety disorders and then major depressive disorder. So we know that half of all mental disorders begin before the age of 14 and one in 10 people aged 12 to 17 in Australia were self-harming. And the really alarming thing is suicide is the biggest killer of young people. So we knew we already had an issue. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, as we know, the, the data's coming in pretty thick and fast about COVID and everything that comes with it. We know just this last month, you know, calls to Kids Helpline have risen by 30% in Victoria in the first six months to 20, of 2021 compared to the first six months of 2020 where we already were in pandemic. And then they've also increased by 14% in New South Wales with their latest lockdown. So, you know, we also know that Beyond Blue is stretched. They're seeing a 29% increase in families reaching out for mental health support. Um, as, As each lockdown gets announced, we are seeing a really big decline in kids' mental health around anxiety, depression, stress tolerance and behaviour. And um, there's been this really cool joint project that's been done by um, Queensland Centre for Perinatal and Infant Mental Health along with Griffith, Griffith, Griffith University, the University of Queensland, University of Southern Queensland and the University of Melbourne. And what they're finding is, <clears throat> as an example, that there was a 28% further decline in kids' mental health between the first and the second lockdown in Victoria. So we're up to lockdown wow. six now and I just really struggle to um, think about where kids are at. I know I'm seeing the cracks are definitely starting to show in my children who've been very resilient throughout this. You know, the worrying part of that statistic or those statistics that you spoke about, 30% increase, um, is that they're the reported ones. What about the unreported ones? But what interests me, though, is that you you say most of those kids, one in seven, four to 17 years, um, was ADHD. That's something Mm -hmm. that may or may not be maybe exacerbated by COVID lockdowns but may not be initiated by but the second and third one, anxiety and major depressive disorder. And, and this is something that befuddles me. As a kid, my growing up was, you know, and we weren't rich. We were quite lower class sort of thing, you know, and we didn't have a care in the world. So what is it that is causing, and I know this is a really big onion layer question, but what do you think is one of the major causes of kids' mental capabilities to date? Are we losing resilience? Yeah, I don't love the word resilience as a as a term to sort of describe whether kids are, you know, mentally buoyant or not. Mm. We live in a very different time. Like I just know there's no way I can ever draw comparisons and talk about how I walk five miles to school back and if we're there and back and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, it yeah. just doesn't compare. We live in a completely different time. So, yes, you know, we've got the internet and we've got, you know, issues around device time. We've got a, a, a world where we have ultra-processed foods, you know, basically the majority of the supermarket shelves are packed with them. But, you know, when I'm looking from as a clinician looking at a a child that's presenting to me with you know very serious agoraphobia or self-harm or you know serious self-esteem issues 
um, there's a whole lot of modifiable risk that could be at play. And we know that can be epigenetics, that can be the toxin load they carry because we live in a, you know, a chemical world now. Um, it can be digestive imbalances. So we're looking at things like malabsorption and dysbiosis. We're also looking at the, you know, the way that the, the psych psychiatry community look at this, which is that neurotransmitter deficiency or sometimes excess but it can also be things like histamine intolerance or glutamate intolerance or hormonal imbalances or pyrrol disorder, you know, nutritional deficiencies or excesses or even just dysglycemia. So they all need to be explored and you end up working out what flavour of mental disorder a child has. Sometimes it's just one of those things. Sometimes it's a combination of all of those things and they need to be investigated thoroughly um, in order to know how to help them. Right. But you spoke about modifiable factors and yet a lot of the, I mean, talking about the the aspects that you, that you mentioned, we're unravelling. It's not just an onion. I mean, this is more than chicken egg this is a beast in itself isn't it it's it's huge like this is massive yeah yeah it definitely can be and i just know from my own personal experience of helping one of my children navigate anxiety and um you know suicidal ideation at the age of eight that there were lots of contributing factors because it took lots of contributing solutions to get my son well so uh yeah you can't just really be thinking oh you know this person's anxious let's just work on GABA and put in some b6 and some magnesium and glutamine and hope that we're going to help the body kind of you know get back to balance it just doesn't work that way rarely does it work that way it may be years ago but I just find, you know, the more I've practiced over the last 15 years, the more complicated um, the clinical picture tends to be. And there are lots of layers of an onion that you're often kind of peeling back to get to really understanding what is driving this, this kind of presentation. Right. And of course, one of those layers has got to do with the family unit. And then you've got the psychosocial, the peer group. Um, so there's, it, it's such an important aspect of a child's life, which one of those is missing at the moment in COVID lockdown, both in the um, Victoria and New South Wales. Um, so let's first talk about the family unit. Like, how do you delve into that? I mean, that must be sometimes yeah. very prickly. I think in COVID it's really difficult because, you know, if sometimes people don't feel safe in their own home and they don't feel like home is truly home just based on the dynamic of how things are set up, the relationships they have with their parents. Um, and in that instance, it's really difficult. And what I know is psychological services in Victoria are so stretched that psychologists are asking people to tap into psychology services interstate because we can telehealth now. And I think that's a really good thing for all naturopaths, nutritionists to be doing is to be ensuring that that piece of the puzzle is always in place and that people are able to reach out and get psychological support. So that goes beyond, you know, the scope of what we can help with but definitely needs to be addressed. So I'm all about the shared care model and ensuring your GP's on board to give you that mental health care plan. Then you've got the psychologist who's also, you know, communicating with you as a clinician so you both know what you're working on. And that way we can help people get the best result. I love the work of Dan Siegel with the whole brain child. So often I'm, you know, getting parents if they can't really tap into psychological services right now to be trying to use very conscious parenting strategies and helping their children understand their own feelings. And when they feel like, you know, they've kind of, they, they talk about this concept of the brain kind of flipping its lid and them feeling out of control. And then always talking about the lifestyle factors that you can introduce like meditations. And I know, 
whenever my son's saying, mum, I need a meditation to fall asleep, that he's a little bit kind of fragile. So they're really good clues that they might need a little bit of extra TLC at this time. Okay, so talking about that, um, uh, starting off a process of helping somebody to reduce their anxiety, um, some people go for CBT, meditation, whatever, we're talking about a vagal response here. Um, and part of that vagal response has got to do with digestion. So this is part of this unravelling of the beast. Where do you start along this way? Do you have to get a quick win with, you know, let's get some meditation in or some, some um, uh, forgive me, there's eye movement exercises that you can do, that's all sorts of things. How do you get that quick win for the child so that the yeah. child trusts you and gives the parent some re reprieve from their anxiety caring for their child? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, you know, in the initial stages where you're really trying to re build rapport and um, educate parents around how, you know, this the, the investigation element of what's going on is important, this is going to take time, you still want to give some symptom relief. Uh, and I find, you know, quite often we can come in with amino acids like L-theanine or taurine. Um, you know, sometimes we want to look at tryptophan. Just depends on, you know, what that clinical picture looks like. But just starting to work around balancing the biochemistry of neurotransmitters can help kids feel better. I and mean, I think we can't forget magnesium either. And often, you know, magnesium glycinate can be a really good way or using glycine with magnesium citrate or magnesium threonate really do help kids just get better sleep onset or feel, you know, less anxious as, you know, or as frequently or, you know, re reducing the intensity of that anxiety for them. So, they're sort of, you know, a little bit more back in their bodies. Um, and sometimes I like a modality that I love referring for where you don't have to ingest or take anything because sometimes you've got kids with sensory issues, so compliance is something to navigate. Sometimes just referring to a really great cranial osteopath can just help them, you know, get that nervous system unwinding a little bit um, and yeah. just, you know, help them feel like there is – the possibility of overcoming this and feeling better. Right. Um, you know, one thing that interests me about the different forms of magnesium is nobody ever taught uh, me about ligands and the various ligands and how they work in college. Um, that was all up to commercial interests to, to teach us that. One thing that interests me is that it's only recently that we've seen this form of magnesium in Australia, let's say over the last two years, and that's magnesium glycerophosphate. When I first saw it, I was reminded of my time consulting in pharmacy where there was this really, really old, it was almost like a galenical um, product, and it was glycerophosphates, and it was as a tonic for children. And it was it really interests me. The, it was cemented in my mind, though, when Mike Ash and um, Garth Nicholson did their work on the gut. And I was thinking, ah, we think it's going to the brain, but is it actually helping the gut, which helps the brain? So it's just really interesting how these so forms work and how, yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting. I just know in my son, because it's obviously it's like for, for Henry, there's definitely like a gut and uh, gut brain axis connection. And you, know, you were talking about vagal innovation being yeah. a part of this. Whenever he feels anxious, it'll go to his tummy. And whenever it goes to his tummy, he just wants an Epsom salt bath. And that, that's right. so interesting <laughs> that you say that. That's just anecdotal, obviously. But, yeah, he's not the first client. Like I've got a few little boys who are a bit the same and so they might kind of get into a habit of needing a bath a few times a week. But when you throw those Epsom salts in, like you are getting another little magnesium hit that must be helping them feel better because they crave it. So is it these quick wins that that enable you to get the not just the child's trust but the parent's trust in 
repeat business if you wanted to be pragmatic or mercenary, um, but but repeat trust so that you are now engaged with the therapy of the child, the ongoing therapy of the child with the, it's not permission, it's uh, it's more than that. It's the acceptance of the parent. You know, the yeah, working look, with think, is know, the word I wanted to use. Yeah. If you've had families come to you that have never really experienced work with a naturopath, there often is this kind of um, expectation around there being a magic bullet, right? So, you know, we see that with pharmaceuticals. Um, and our process is very different. You know, my process, particularly at the outset, is all about exploration through very thorough investigations. So if we can get a blood draw with a child, that's a bonus. But quite often it's urine, hair, stool that we're using with functional labs to explore various elements of health to work out what those contributing factors to their mental health picture are. And I just need parents to feel like while we're exploring that, we are seeing some improvement in their picture and it does take the load off. So parents don't feel worn down because it can be very difficult to feel like a present and calm parent when this has been wearing you down. It affects the family environment in a big way, um, in a negative way quite often. And um, we just want to get that quick win, um, not just to get them to come back, but to make their day-to-day -day experience uh, a lot easier. I know this is a bit of a deflection onto the parent as well, but do you find that ha uh, when you're treating the child that you have to treat the parent as well because they're at the end of their tether um, and potentially, you know, their stresses um, are mirrored by the child to some degree? Um, uh, there's a second part of this question as well, and that's to do with siblings. Do you involve siblings in this so that there's no antagonism between the siblings or they're getting all the attention because they're sick? I can remember thinking this of my brother. Yeah, that's that's really big. Look, I write, I've written in the past a lot around this concept of radical self-care because women tend to really shelve their own well-being and put their kids first there's that whole element of you know the burnt chop syndrome where you end up being the one that's eating the chop that no one else wants to eat because you overcooked it but really for me i i find women only really or mothers and they're predominantly the people i see that are reaching out um, to help their children they they struggle to put themselves at the front of the line and to understand that they've got to be well in order for their kids to be well. Um, so I do have those conversations with them, but quite often they're not ready and they will often, you know, sort of put their child as the priority. And it can feel really overwhelming often to try and work on two people's health at the same time. Um, right. So quite often sort of get their kid on, on track and then I'll sort of shift my focus and, and talk to, well, hey, you're pretty stressed and, you know, you're obviously not, you know, eating lunch and you're not really looking after yourself and you're not getting out and exercising. So there's a, there is some of that that we'll start, you know, talking about to help them look after themselves. And then when it comes to siblings, I do like to understand the dynamic, to understand the stresses um, that are being experienced across the family unit. But, um, yeah, you do end up treating whole families over time. Mm, mm. Um, I just want to temper something I said. I said about my brother and my jealousy sort of thing, and all he had was his tonsils out. And I was yes. jealous that he got to eat jelly. And ice cream. <laughs> I mean, it was so, so selfish of me and so, so trivial. But anyway, sorry, no. Dave. Um so let's get further into treatment. You mentioned a few things, the magnesiums. You said theanine. What about other neurotransmitter um, uh, precursors? Do you ever use those? Uh, and how do you actually get the child to take these? Yeah, so we do a lot of our own compounding in the clinic uh, of, of amino acids. So I love really working on identifying the biochemical pathways I think need support. So 
often it will be that combination of either identifying if a child is a high or a low dopamine um, child. And we, if we can do genetic profiling, that's really, really helpful to understand how those neurotransmitters are probably behaving, but also asking the right questions to identify where they sit on the spectrum of, of deficiencies or excesses with neurotransmitters. So, um, yeah, the gabinergic pathway, like using herbs as well. So sometimes you just want to be doing a little bit of valerian or working with kava um, where you see it kind of fits the picture. Um, but yeah, you know, tyrosine as a cofactor for dopamine production, exploring what thyroid function looks like because that can have a huge impact on mood. Um, but it just depends on the flavour um, of of whether we think this is predominantly, you know, neurotransmitters out of balance, but sometimes you've got to kind of track back and go, well, why, you know, they might have methylation issues and that's impacting their ability to produce release and break down their neurotransmitters. And you've got to work on that. But then I know from clinical experience, just focusing on methylation and knowing that sometimes in order to be able to positively impact in, in, and balance methylation, you've got to be working on underlying gut problems or underlying heavy metal toxicity in order for, you know, your methyl donors to do their work and it to, to really assist the child in feeling more balanced mentally and emotionally. So it's a bit like a ball of wool sometimes. You feel like you're sort of untangling and, and kind of pulling it out and going, oh, okay, this is what is going on. And it can be very multifactorial. Um, but I think in the initial stages, working to balance neurotransmitter production and addressing nutritional deficiencies, you tend to see an improvement while you do the underlying corrective work in the background. Um, to eventually have them, you know, right on top of things and back in balance. How much do you focus on um, nutrient deficiencies and how much do you focus on food as, a, as yeah, like a, good question. You know, a treatment? Yeah, I think the majority of the time and a lot of other practitioners probably find this as well, what I tend to see is you know, really pronounced zinc deficiency in, in patients. So with that, just being zinc deficient in and of itself, you're going to see a child with a narrow palate. You're going to see, you know, really picky eating kind of, you know, presentation as well. And so I find that by just working on topping up their zinc levels over two or three months, we start to see this kind of openness to bringing in new foods. So I'm all about keep presenting the foods that they've rejected, keep putting it on the plate, don't make a big deal out of it. Um, and eventually they will eat the broccoli. Might take six months or sometimes took one of my kids 12 months. But um, now they're, you know, great at eating broccoli. So I think zinc tends to be one of those key minerals that kids, you know, time and time again present with deficiency for that. Um, so I'm routinely testing plasma zinc, total vitamin B12, iron studies, um, and looking at their folate levels to get a sense of where they're sitting with those. And then when it comes to diet, working within the parameters of what works in that family. So some kids are just not going to drink a green smoothie to get, you know, active folate from those uncle leafy greens but other kids might. So I have to maybe sometimes create a blueberry smoothie and put some spinach or some silver beet into that in order to let the purple of the blueberry kind of hide it and get it in there. So we can be a bit sneaky, but sometimes we are solely relying on supplements in order to kind of open up the picture so those kids can be more receptive to eating more whole foods in their diet. This is very interesting because that's kind of like 
comparing and contrasting the work of Julia Rucklidge in in Massey University in um, New Zealand. So this is Professor Julia Rucklidge versus um, Professor Felice Jacker. So Julia Rucklidge used a multivitamin to help with mood in ADHD kids, I think it was. And Felice Jacker talks about the the mood and forgive me she's got a center i've got, forgotten the name of it the food and mood the center m- yeah taken thank you yeah, yeah and where I just she concentrates on diet now that's a really interesting contrast there but i guess there yeah. comes a point where to get that quick win you have to intercede with something while you're working on changing a diet so is that how yeah. you work you use supplements in Absolutely. the initial stage while you're retraining gotcha yeah, I think because we kind of work in the natural health space and are so acutely aware around diet quality and, and what good quality looks like, to us it's a bit of a no-brainer. But I think we've just got to kind of meet our clients where they are and just be that step ahead or just above. So when we're providing recommendations around what they should be focusing on eating, you can't expect someone who's been eating cocoa pops every morning for the last five years to stretch into you know creating this beautiful high protein healthy fat you know egg avocado sort of frittata thing for breakfast like it's just too big a stretch so for me it might be well let's explore um a smoothie and let's have a look at how we can maybe add a little bit of really clean protein powder into that and what flavors does that child like so I think it's really important to meet people where they're at and make it accessible and then build from there. Yeah, a a salient piece of uh, or lesson that I learnt was to try and get away from bread and I'm not totally successful with it, okay, but to try and get away from bread, my morning breakfast was instead of having, you know, scrambled eggs on toast, I'd make an omelette with mushies, with tomatoes, with spinach, that made me so damn full. I, I couldn't even eat. I couldn't even look at it. It was just pushed it aside. It was a really interesting mind flip, though, that I'd still cook the toast for a while until yeah. I just realised I, I don't need the toast. I just need the food, That's funny. you know, the eggs. Yeah, but it's amazing. Like once you have, and this is the thing, right, like getting people to experience something new and then the benefit of that. Like I know when I flip yeah. from eating porridge for breakfast and feeling like really hungry an hour later to having, you know, eggs with lots of veggies beside it and not needing a single thing till lunch. That for me was like a game changer around regulating my blood sugars, my energy, my mood was so much better by doing a high protein, healthy fat brekkie. Oh God, I'm just salivating now about the mushies I cook. And and uh, the <laughs> trick the trick for the trick for me as a bloke was to make it all in one fry pan. No other pots and pans. It was the washing up that was the, <laughs> that was a limiting factor. I thought it was funny. Yeah. So um you mentioned um methylation issues before. And I've heard um that if you give some people MTHF that it can actually flip and make them make them more anxious. How do you navigate this? Because that would take away that quick win. How do you sort of intercede with something like the active folates when mm. we've got this issue that it might, you might get a, a negative side effect from it? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think having a genetic profile in front of you gives you a bit more information around whether someone's going to be in you know, tetra, um, methyl tetrahydrofolate uh, candidate. And, and that I have seen people really respond quite poorly to some of the um, methyl donor formulas that are out there. So it's really rare that I bring in methylfolate as a supplement, particularly in children. I don't find I need it. And I know that in that instance, you can do a food as medicine approach, you know, get them trying to do uncooked leafy greens, whether that's salad or smoothie, if, if they tolerate it, or even, you know, having oranges, like looking at other high folate foods and um, starting with that and starting with some 
you know, methylate, like methylcobalamin or hydroxycobalamin as another way to support the methylation pathway tends to work really quite safely as a starting point. Um, and, and then um, just ensuring that, you know, you, you, you get a sense of what needs support in the folate cycle and the methionine cycle and then being a bit more targeted around nutrient cofactor support um, but I tend to steer away from methylfolate I just find yeah people can aggravate and the last thing I want is clients aggravating because they're no one wants to experience that I've done that to myself <laughs> in the past right and it doesn't feel very good. right okay so of course part of this treatment strategy is um, forming treatment goals and indeed in some cases when you've got resistant patients, particularly those who are, you know, brought up on the white diet, you know, the white bread, the white fish, the white, all ultra processed food, um, is to make contracts. How do you navigate treatment goals and contracts so that you end up getting the best results and pulling them along the way willingly? Mm, I think you've got to kind of read the client around what is attainable. And I do talk a lot to, you know, the importance of right now we're working on this and next we're going to work on this and down the track we're working on this so that they have a path, a really clear path of, okay, so while we do this, it's fixing this, but there's also more that we want to be addressing and it gives people some guidance they don't feel like they're in the dark every supplement if they're given one I, I always provide a rationale on that prescription of what that's doing um, so in terms of um, contracts I tend to just sort of work on one key thing and just keep asking about it because no one ever really learned anything by being told once often i'm having to constantly talk about how are we going with gluten free at the moment because we know you know that you are celiac gene positive how are we going with the swaps where are you what's hard what's what what do you need help with and by helping people troubleshoot they can continue to maintain their end of the contract um so Often we're really coaching clients um, in an ongoing fashion and kind of also being, you know, their cheer squad when they when they are kind of fulfilling the contract as well. So just being a part of their journey and, and letting them know you're invested in their outcomes tends to keep them on the hook and happy to keep doing the work. You know, I think you just said a really important point there about being their cheer squad. I think it was Kate Holm speaking with her that I, um, she not first said it, but it, it's indelled in my brain. Um, I have to ask just one last quick question, and that is um, safety issues. When do you tread really lightly? Lightly, You were talking about MTHF with kids. What about things yeah. like iron? How high do you go? What forms do you like with iron and others? Yeah, I think you've definitely got to go with, um, you know, a weight uh, based kind of um, dosage range. So often I'm using, you know, about 25 milligrams of iron in an adult a day, um, either at the start or the end of the day, just in terms of, you know, really optimising the uh, bioavailability, bioavailability of that iron with the hepcidin sort of um, doorways opening for that iron to be absorbed well. Um, so it's really just based on the weight of the child that I'm able to do that calculation using Young's rule. Um, and I don't really steer any, I don't go higher with that. I find with zinc that you can be a bit more liberal, particularly if you're suspecting that they've got some low stomach acid issues. And that's a bit the same with iron two and, and B12, just making sure that you are supporting healthy HCL production because of that vagal nerve innovation um, involvement that can be there for some kids you've got to really work on optimizing absorption of those key nutrients that need HCL um, but yeah I think a place where I tread very lightly and I hear myself sort of saying it is when I'm doing microbiome balancing work so when it comes to bacterial overgrowth 
when we're looking at pathogenic um, parasite infections, being really careful around the herbs I choose to help assist with, you know, uh, uh, um, resolving those sorts of infections is really important and definitely ensuring that you're going into damage control around repopulating lost elements of the microbiome using pre and probiotics because that's such a delicate sort of ecosystem and often children are still just forming their microbiome so particularly in young ones like i i just won't even run a comprehensive stool analysis and and treat any kind of overgrowths in the child under the age of two um and then as they get a bit older and i feel like the microbiome is more resilient um i will you know probably look at being a little bit more liberal and, and more confident around bringing in, you know, a combination of different herbs and chemical constituents that I know are going to be useful. But yeah, that's probably one, another area where I just think, be careful. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great and wise words. Um, Susan, there's so much more to this, obviously. I mean, yeah. mental health disorders and issues, are, as you say, it's a burgeoning, unfortunate area. Let's word that properly. It's unfortunately a burgeoning area of care and concern, and you are an expert in the responsible care of these children and indeed their caregivers and, and, and family units. So I thank you so much for sharing what we can in like a 45-minute segment. This really requires a webinar minimum of conference, a two-, three-day conference to give it any sort of credence. But I thank you so much for taking us through just a few tips and pearls today on Wellness by Design. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us today. Of course, you can catch up on all the other podcasts and the show notes for this podcast, which I'm sure there's going to be heaps on the Wellness for, um, by Design, forgive me, on the Designs for Health website. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook, and this is Wellness by Designs.